If you're like me, you probably deployed a lot of Next.js apps on cloud providers like DigitalOcean. I've hit the same problem so many times. I try to build a Next.js app on a tiny one gigabyte RAM Ubuntu droplet and suddenly the CPU spikes, the server freezes and the whole build crashes. When this happened, I kept assuming that the machine just wasn't powerful enough. So I always chose to upscale the server. Then I learned that there's a solution to this problem without the need of upscaling. That solution is embarrassingly simple. It's called a swap file. Just adding a swap file fixed my build issues on the smallest droplet tier and I didn't even need to scale the server at all. This ended up saving me a lot of money and headaches. In this video, we will talk about what a swap file is when it helps, when it does more harm than good, and I will walk you through how to set one up on your own container. It's gonna be a lot of fun, so let's dive into it. Next.js builds look like simple node processes, but they actually hit memory harder than you expect. During a build, node spins up workers, loads TypeScript, bundles client and server code, and processes images, all this happens in a short burst. That burst is enough to push a one gigabyte RAM droplet to its limit. And here's where it gets tricky. When your server runs out of physical memory and there is no swap file to fall back on, the system has only two choices. It can freeze or it can start killing processes. This is why your build crashes and why the CPU graph looks like a roller coaster. The machine is fighting for memory and everything just slows down. A swap file gives a system an escape route. It lets the kernel move rarely used memory pages to disk and frees up enough RAM for the build to finish. It's not fast, but it doesn't have to be. It just gives your build some extra breathing room. Swap is most useful when you have a light application that runs comfortably in RAM, but occasionally needs a burst of extra memory. And this is exactly the situation with Next.js builds on small servers. During normal traffic, your app barely uses memory, but that initial build step temporarily needs more than you actually have. So swap works well for build steps that spike memory, package installs, data imports or migrations, occasional admin scripts, or containers that need headroom during deploys. In these cases, you want stability more than raw speed. Even if a task runs a little slower, it still finishes and that is a win. But swap is not a replacement for real RAM. It's a safety net. If your production app constantly dips into swap, you will feel it. The machine will become sluggish because it keeps shuffling data between RAM and disk constantly. This can hurt response times and make your server feel overloaded even if the traffic is normal. So you should not rely heavily on swap if your app uses more memory than the droplet has on a daily basis or your database cache is paging into swap or your swap usage stays high even during idle hours, or if your latency becomes noticeable during normal operations. In these situations, the real fix is adding more RAM or optimizing memory usage. Swap only helps with short bursts. It does not solve long-term capacity problems. Okay, so now let's see a practical example. Here I am in my DigitalOcean dashboard, and I'm going to create a simple Ubuntu server with one gigabyte of RAM and 25 gigabytes of disk space. Once the server is ready, I'm going to SSH into it. And on this server, I will try to install this project. It's called Payload CMS, which is a very popular Next.js backend CMS framework that I oftentimes use for my personal projects. So I'm gonna go ahead and run pnpx create payload app at latest and then it will ask me for a bunch of setup questions. I'm just gonna name it payload and choose SQLite as my database for simplicity's sake. So once everything finishes, we now get a message that the payload project was successfully created, but it failed to initialize the Git repository because it failed to install the dependencies. And there's a reason for that, you'll see why. But that's okay, we can still do it manually so now let's cd into our payload directory and now let's run pnpmi to install those dependencies. I'm gonna fast forward this process a bit and after a minute or two, we will see that the install fails with the message killed. This is because npm killed our process because it ran out of memory. And this is where we hit that RAM bottleneck on our small server. So now let's see how a swap file can save us in this situation. 
So first, let's check if our server is already using swap files. If we run sudo swap on with the show flag, if we don't get anything back, that means that there are no swap files active on our server. We can also verify this by running free with the h flag. And we see here how much memory we have in total and how much is currently allocated for swap, which is nothing in our case. And before we add our swap file, let's also make sure we have enough disk space to do so. We can check our disk usage by typing df with an h flag. And we can see here that so far we have only used 18% of our total disk space. So we have plenty enough to allocate a swap file. So now let's go ahead and create a one gigabyte large swap file. We can do this by simply typing sudo fallocate with an l flag specifying one gigabyte and the name of our swap file, which is gonna be swap file. And just like that, we've created a swap file. We can verify that the correct amount of space was reserved by typing ls with an lh flag, followed by the swap file name, and this confirms that we have indeed allocated the right size. But we're not quite done yet. We still need to turn this swap file into an actual swap space. But first, we need to lock down the permissions of this file so only the users with root privileges can read the contents of it. We can do that by running sudo chmod 600 on the swap file. And let's verify again that the changes have been applied by running the same command we ran earlier. And indeed our file is now secured. So next we need to mark this file as swap space. And we can do this by running sudo mkswap with the swap file name. And if you get this output, it means that it has been successfully marked. And the last thing we need to do here is activate it by running sudo swap on with the swap file name. And now if we run sudo swap on with the show flag, we will see that there is now one swap file active in our swap space. So with the swap space now active, let's try to run pnpmi again. And if everything is correct, we should now be able to install all the dependencies without running into memory issues. And there you go, we had no memory issues, everything ran successfully. And if we run free with the H flag again, we can now see that our swap file is using 42 megabytes of space. Now that we have our swap space, we can finally go ahead and build our payload CMS project. But first, just for demonstration purposes, I will turn off the swap file just so you can see how the build process runs without it. If I now run pnpm build, the process will start to build, but it will freeze because of the out of memory issues. I actually left this build running on my droplet to see how long it would take, and I kid you not, it ran for like 40 minutes and it still wasn't finished. If we look at the CPU usage graph here, we can see that the process started at around 1.14 p.m. and ran up to 1.40 p.m. and the entire time the CPU usage was peaking at 90%. Honestly, I got tired of waiting so I just had to manually shut off the droplet to stop the process. So at this point, most of the developers, including me, would think to upscale the server to get better performance, but a swap file can actually help us out here. So I turned the server back on, and now let's go back inside and configure the swap space to make our project pass the build phase. I tried running the build phase with a one gigabyte swap file, but even then the process could not keep up and it crashed. And that's because there's another issue here. As we can see, the payload build command uses a max old space size of 8,000, and that is too large for our small server. Ideally, we would want to have a max old space size which is lower or equal to the swap space that we have allocated. And I kind of have the feeling that one gigabyte might not be enough. So what I'm going to do here first is go to my package JSON file and decrease the max old space size to two gigabytes, and that should be enough to pass our build. But we still only have one swap file with one gigabyte of space. So we need to bump up the swap space. So there's two ways you can do it. You can delete this swap file and just create a two gigabyte swap file, or we can simply add another swap file with one extra gigabyte. To do this, we just have to go through the same process, this time just naming the new swap file differently, like swap file two. And once we do that, we now see that we have two gigabytes of swap space available. So with both of these changes, we can now run the build process again. And after eight minutes, we finally see that our project has compiled successfully. And if we go back to the CPU graph, 
We can now see that during our build phase, our CPU usage was kept at a stable rate and our disk IO usage was lower as well. So that's basically it. I hope this shows you how you can effectively utilize swap files to fix the heavy out of memory issues when running builds. Honestly, for most of the projects, the latency and the speed of my apps after builds are usually pretty steady. It's the build itself that usually tends to crash the small size droplets. So most of the time, it just doesn't make sense to upscale it just for the builds. So I hope you found this tutorial useful. If you did, be sure to smash that like button underneath the video. And folks, if you like these types of technical breakdowns, be sure to subscribe to our channel. This has been Andres from BetterStack, and I will see you in the next videos.